for. This is an opportunity for all of us to get together and talk about accounting. Um, everyone that's here, we want to welcome you today. Uh, Karen Sepatelli, she is uh, an accountant, and I'll let her explain her background and introduce herself here in just a moment. But the idea of us asking her and others to, uh, to help present on QuickBooks and accounting is based off the uh, success that we've had with Accounting 101. That success is driven by a lot of need that's out there for small business owners. And we're actually in the tax season right now, as many of us are getting our, our affairs in order for, uh, for income taxes and, and small business. Just one more complex entity on top of that that makes challenges. Uh, but today, this is an informal training session, one that we like to do weekly uh, of different topics and so forth. But this is on a topic that we're going to continue doing in different levels. Today, Karen is, is doing a follow-on to our general accounting 101 class. And this is uh, where she's going to actually talk about QuickBooks and just basic generic operations on it. From that, uh, we're hoping you're able to get some key takeaways on it just knowledge of how to use the software online. The uh, follow-up to that, we have uh, set up with uh, students that we have working on internships through the, uh, the SPDC here at Clark, uh, where they can work one-on-one -on -one with each, each one of our clients. I can, or any one of the advisors can do the same thing here. The follow-on from that is to be able to set you up with a relationship with a bookkeeper, a bookkeeping practice that Karen has, or others that, that are similar to that. And then actually as a, as a precursor to uh, being with a uh, CPA. But it's, it's there for one reason, and that's to help you uh, operate your business more efficiently. Now, some of you have been, have been to our webinars before, and you, you know some of the rules of engagement that we have. Sarah Doran is here, and she's gonna be looking for you to wave your hand, whatever you gotta do, or use the uh, reactions and online to be able to catch our attention if you have a question. Just keep in mind, we just want it to be informal and more of a dialogue. So if you have a question, raise your hand or put it in the chat and we'll be quick to uh, try to respond to it. But that being said, I wanna introduce Karen Sepatelli and, and her practice there of helping businesses actually do their books and prepare for taxes. Karen's got a wonderful practice she's had here in the greater Worcester area for many years and has helped many businesses. But Karen, thank you very much for taking time today and, and volunteering to teach us about QuickBooks. Yeah, I'm happy to, Tom. Yes, yeah, so thank you for having me here today. So I'll just take a minute or two, um, an introduction about myself. Um, I'm an enrolled agent with the IRS and I'm the owner of Acorn Business Advisors for about 20 years now. A common question is, what's the difference between a CPA and an EA? The biggest difference is CPAs are licensed at the state level, enrolled agents, EAs are licensed at the national level. I can do just about anything that a CPA can do. There are some minute differences that really come into play very rarely, that sort of thing. Um, so like I said, I'm an enrolled agent with the IRS and having done taxes for decades now, um, what that brings, helps me bring to the bookkeeping is that I try to um, teach my clients and do for my clients bookkeeping in such a way that you have the information you need to do your taxes. There's nothing more frustrating than when a tax preparer gets a set of books and it's, it can't be used for the taxes. It's just not in the right format. It's not done correctly. So what I'm going to do today is show you how to do it in such a way that it can be used for the taxes. And um, I've been using um, QuickBooks products um, for all of my 20 years here. Um, I'm on the elite status, which means I have an awful lot of clients on QuickBooks as well. And the way I want to do the um, this program this morning is show you um, using QuickBooks Online, um, some of the different features, how to use it, how to set it up, and what it can do for you and your business. So what I have here, and just to let you know, if you see my head moving around and such, um, it's on a screen over here. I'm going to see what I can do here. But this is uh, QuickBooks Online. Now, one thing I want to say is there are a variety of different things with QuickBooks Online. 
they're self-employed, which I really don't recommend, but then they have simple start, they have essentials, they have pro, they have advanced, they have a wide variety of different options, different price points, and also what you need. The reason I say don't use self-employed is I've had many clients come to me with self-employed and they're like, I can't do this, I can't do that. So it's very limiting. And from what I find, new business owners, it doesn't do what they need. So at least do the simple start. What you're going to see here on my screen is the accountant version of QuickBooks. So this includes everything. So depending on what version you have, you may or may not have all of these things. And also they may be in slightly different um, areas. But everything in QuickBooks, there's always about three different ways to get to something. And you can get all of them are right. None of them are wrong. It depends on what you like to do. So right here, I have um, started this file. It's called My New Business. So um, a lot of times I get a question, when do I need to start with QuickBooks? And my answer to that is once you start having bank transactions. It's never too early and it kind of is never too late, but you might have more catching up to do that sort of thing. So this is a basic thing. So you have a listing over here of the different items. And then over here in the workspace, it's these same things just in a different format. So you get money in, these are the different things you would use, money out, and the accounting and reporting, your three basic areas of QuickBooks there. I'm gonna keep my so, camera off because I'm eating. Oh, okay, I don't think that was meant for me. But if anyone has any questions, whatever, put them in the chat or raise your hand. Sarah is uh, has offered to help with all of that stuff today to help me keep everything under control and be sure you get your questions answered. So a good place to start here is banking because banking is going to be what drives everything in QuickBooks. So if we go to banking, what you can do within QuickBooks is connect QuickBooks to your bank account. This is easy to do. 99% um, of banks that I have dealt with offer this service. And um, so when you're opening your bank account, be sure to use a bank that does business banking. Two questions to ask your bank when you open the account. One, do you have an interface with QuickBooks Online? And number two, Ask if they have a read-only ID, also known as an accountant's ID. Even if that's not something you need right away, that's a signal that this is truly a business account. Because if and when you hire a bookkeeper, you want to be able to give that person a read-only ID so they can go in, because this is what I like to do. I can go in, I can look at the various things, I can look at the activity, but I can't add anyone to bill pay. I can't transfer accounts and anything like that. So as much as my clients say they trust me, or if you hire someone that you trust explicitly with your books, it's always best to use a read-only ID. It protects you. It protects them. So what you would do here is you can just connect an account bank or credit card. And then if let's say you start, you're starting QuickBooks in December, or actually if you're starting now and you had account activity throughout 2021, some bank feeds only go back maybe three or four months. Some will go back two years, it depends. If your bank feed does not go back as far as you need to, you can use this upload transactions button, which means you go into your bank account. You can talk to your bank about how to download the files into a QBO file. Most will do that if it's a business account. You'll know you have a personal account if when you're trying to download the transactions, if it goes to Quicken. 
The difference is Quicken is personal, QuickBooks is business. And the reason that's important is that Quicken does not do what's called a balance sheet. I know Tom touched on this in the Accounting 101 class because personals don't need business, don't need a balance sheet. Businesses need a balance sheet. So if you have a business, go with QuickBooks, not with Quicken. And that's another reason to be sure you have a business account. And so you can upload these files, manually upload them, bring in your transactions automatically. I'm not going to do this today fully, but you can pick your bank and you can get all of that started and you import your transactions. And then from there, you can automate your transactions. You can go through the list and enter everything into QuickBooks. It's just kind of hard to do with someone's bank account on something like this. But that's how we get everything into QuickBooks essentially is through the bank fees. And there are different apps that you can use as well. Um, one thing I will say about apps is just because something can connect with QuickBooks doesn't mean it should. Um, Square is over here. So depending on how you're using Square or PayPal, things like that, I've had clients come to me where they had these types of things hooked into QuickBooks and they had thousands upon thousands of transactions entering QuickBooks. All these different customer accounts were being created and things like that. And it was not adding any value to QuickBooks. So we disconnected them and they could get the reports they needed from Square or PayPal. And QuickBooks became, this is what we use just to handle the money. So that could be an entire class in and of itself. The warning here is before you hook anything up into QuickBooks, make sure it's what you want to do. And you can always disconnect it if it doesn't go well. Banking, you can also do rules. So you can say, okay, every time I go to Panera Bread, it's a meals expense. When I go to Staples, it's an office expense. So you can teach QuickBooks what you want it to do with certain things so that you don't have to go through every single transaction. That can be very helpful as well. Tags are also offered. And this is where you can just put a little more information into different transactions. Um, tags, groups, um, the example they give here is like if you're selling, let's say, aerobics classes or yoga classes, and you want to track how much you're bringing in for each of those different things, you can use tags, along with a breakdown of what you are spending. Now, if you notice over here, there are videos throughout QuickBooks Online. See how it works. They're generally under five minutes, and I have to say they actually do a really good job. So if there's something that you're doing, you know, the AI within QuickBooks is going to say, hey, we think this would be helpful for you. And it's going to show you a video right there. So you can always click on that and watch it. Karen? Yes. Um, Stephanie wants to know, does QuickBooks have its own payment processing platform? Yes, they do. They have their own merchant services platform. It is very easy to apply to. You now just do it right online. And the rates are competitive with others. So um, you're not paying extra there and it ties in seamlessly. So once we get to like, you know, invoicing in your customers, I'll get into that a little bit more, but yeah, that is a great question. You can do all of that right through Quick QuickBooks as well your money to come in. And then a fairly new thing within the past year or two is receipts. So you can upload receipts into QuickBooks and that way you can have those things. Now, sometimes, all right, you may not need all your receipts from, you know, when you go to Dunkin' Donuts or, you know, little things like that or gas receipts and things like that. 
And the IRS does have a de minimis rule of $25. So they don't require a receipt for things under 25. When receipts get important is when you're buying larger ticket items because how those are treated tax-wise, it depends on different things. Let's say you go to an office supply store and you spend $2,000. All right, did you spend that $2,000 on buying an awful lot of paper? Or did you spend $2,000 to buy a computer? The tax treatment for each of those is different. So having the receipt in QuickBooks where your bookkeeper could see it, maybe your tax professional could see it, is very helpful. So this way, I mean, let's face it, nine, 10 months later, none of us is going to remember what we spent that $2,000 on. So having the receipt in here is great. You can upload it from your computer. You can upload it from Google Drive. You can forward it from an email. So you can say, okay, every time I get an email from such and such a company, here's my QuickBooks email address. And you can do that. So if I click set up forwarding email, I can set up an email at qbodocs.com and it will just automatically send this in there as well. And what happens is all of this stuff comes down through here. So that way you can match it up and put it in there. Here's a trick though, do the receipts before you do the bank feed. Because if you put it in receipts and you've got it all nice and where it's supposed to go, then in banking, it'll match it up. You can't do banking and then add a receipt. It has to go that way. So Aaron, have, does, does the receipt link to a specific transaction? Daniel wants to know. Um, yes, it will. Yes, it will. So if the receipt, let's say um, you used your, um, your Bank of America bank account to pay for you know, a $50 purchase somewhere. What'll happen is you can come in here, put the receipt in through one of these methods. I don't know why I'm pointing, you can't see me point. <laughs> but anyway, um, you come in here, you tell what it is, you know, who it was for. I'm a big proponent of always put in a vendor name. You never know when you're going to need it. So you'd put that in here to say, I spent $50 at this store. It was for office supplies. Then when you go over to banking, when this shows up, it's going to show there's a match and it'll put it together for you. Does that answer your question? I hope so. And Jo Lynn has her hand up. Mm -hmm. Jo Lynn, you want to unmute and ask your question? This is set 2A. Yeah, so, so I'm used to uh, entering in an so. expense and, or a bill and Let's uploading an attachment to that individually. Oh, can I just interrupt you, Jo Lynn? I think someone sure. has so their insane. speaker on. I'm having a hard okay. time so hearing Jo Lynn. That might be my people so, behind so me speaking. So can you guys be, so, excuse me, can you guys be quiet for like 10 seconds while I make a question? Sorry. Sorry, we have a small office here. Um, oh, no problem. I, so, I just want to make sure that I hear you. So I, I typically may uh, enter an expense or a bill. And at that point in time, I attach the document. Is that similar to what's going on here? And yeah, so uh, secondly, so I can mute myself. Yeah. Um, I see that you upload a document at the same time. Are you filling in the transaction information for that receipt at the same time? Because I see in your uh, screen that down there, you have the opportunity to associate information um, pertaining to that receipt. OK, so I'm going to unmute. Or I'm gonna okay. Mute. All right, Jolyn, thank you for that question there. So yes, yeah, so um, the other way of doing it is like as you're adding in an expense. So if we were down here at expenses, um, this brings me back, but like if I hit new, if I hit new and I hit a new expense, let's say here, as I enter that in, there is this box down here that says attachments. So yes, you can move anything you want into there. It handles up to 20 megabytes of 
information. So you can upload multiple things there as well. So that is a perfectly fine way of doing it. Um, like I said, in QuickBooks, there are many different ways to do the same job and get it accomplished. Um, what I find doing a lot more with the receipts in banking is sometimes if you have someone who is not necessarily doing the bookkeeping, who you know has a receipt, but they're not going to be the one going into QuickBooks and doing it, you know, having them save it from the a Google Drive, having them forward the email is a nice way to like segregate the job. So that way, you know, if you have one of your employees going out and buying something, they can just send it here for receipts and then you can do it from here. Either way, it's going to go to the same place. That sort of thing. One thing I will say is uploading to receipts is not instantaneous. It seems to take about five to 10 minutes to do that. So depending on how you're working or things like that, you know, just keep that in mind. So if you wanna do it right now, I'd say go into expense and then upload it from there or else you can use this as well. And I believe um, if you use the QBO app, you can also take a picture on your phone for the receipt and that will go directly into here as well. So lots of different ways to do it. Yeah, yes, Sarah? Um, Stephanie, and this sort of tags on to this, she has been hesitating to use QuickBooks. She has heard that some people have issues accessing all their receipts uploaded to QuickBooks. She wants to know if you have had this issue with any of your clients, like the physical pictures. No, I haven't. Um, no, I, I can't say that's been an issue. Um, with that in mind though, QuickBooks itself is not a document storage service. So you can find your receipts by going into each thing individually. It's not like a Google Drive where you can then log in and see 100 receipts all at once. So it's just a matter of understanding what QuickBooks is doing with the receipts. And does that match what you want it to be able to do? I don't know if that answers that question. Stephanie, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And I'm assuming that with physical receipts, like it's it's able to translate the words and amounts on it, right? Like if it's a photo of a receipt. You know, AI does the best it can. I'll start that way. Um, it's definitely not going to take over 100%. Because some receipts have way too much advertising, gobbledygook, and stuff like that on them. So, you know, Intuit AI is going to take what it can find. What it can find is not always what you think it should be. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Yo, yo, you're you're welcome. You're welcome. So I always say, you know, just double check it. I would never put my faith 100% in the automation of it. So just just double check is all I would say. Yeah. All right. So um, any other questions, Sarah? Uh, I, uh, um, Talison, I could be mispronouncing your name. Um, since you say to do the receipt first, do you then have to wait 10 minutes before logging the expense? Mm -hmm. Right. So basically, you know, if you're going to use the receipt feature, yeah, you um, and you upload it, I'd say, you know, you have to give it time to actually upload it through the system. This is all in the cloud. So if you're going to use this function, then yeah, I would say, you know, upload it, you know, and then wait for it to upload. The reason I mentioned that delay is because I've had, you know, clients or I see things on 
uh, Facebook groups with, you know, I uploaded a bunch of receipts and they're not there. Why aren't they there? It's like, okay, you got to give it a little bit of time. It's got to go up to the cloud. They got to do something. It's got to come back and whatever it does um, from the commuting, you know, computing perspective there. But yeah, if you're going to do this, you know, wait a couple of minutes or like Joe Lynn does it. If you want to do it right away, just enter it as an expense. And if you enter it as an expense, it will still match the bank fee. All right, so I think I'm going to skip invoicing for right now because we are so into expenses here. And I just wanna take a look at this feature here. So the expenses are what you actually spent. And once again, it wants me to connect the bank feed. Um, and a vendor is someone that you pay money to. Anyone that you pay is a vendor. Of course, you know, that does not include employees. That's a whole other topic. But I put a couple in here. And so what you want to be able to do with your vendors is keep track of who you're paying. So when you enter a new one, I just put in contractor here. There's this, if you do new or if there's somebody you just threw in here, you can hit edit. And this gives you lots of room to put in lots of information about your vendor. So you can, depending on what type of vendor, first name, middle, last, title, suffix, the name of the company, and how you want to display the name. So this gives you, let's say, you're using ABC Supply and your contact there is Sarah Doran. We'll use that. Um, so you can put Sarah's name over here. You can use ABC Supply over here. And under this display name, you can pick either the name or the company. What I like to do is do both. So I might pick, you know, display name as ABC Supply dash Sarah. So that way when it pops up, I can see both. And that's helpful, especially um, with a lot of businesses that small businesses do business with. All right, we know one person's name, but we may not know the other. And we want to be able to put these things together. So put in as much information as you can. And if you're printing checks per se, you can say what name you want on that check. So the company may be ABC Supply, but let's say the check gets payable to the parent company. You can always designate that as well. Address, uh, put that in if you have it, even if you're not mailing checks, because you never know, because with everything in QuickBooks, you can export it to an Excel file, you can use it in a mail merge, you can do a lot of different things with it. So while you're setting up a vendor, and you have all this information in front of you, put it all into QuickBooks. You may not need it for a while, or you know, you may never need it, but if you do, it's invaluable to get it in there. Notes, whatever it is, you know, if it's a vendor that you go to, you know, you know, blue building on Main Street next to whatever. You know, you can put in anything about the address, the client, the vendor themselves, what you buy from them, anything. And once again, you can put in attachments. You can put in your um, contract with these people. You can put in their bank information, you know, whatever they give you, you can put there, including their 1099, a copy of that. On this other side, you can put in an email or multiple emails. And whatever other information you have, phone, mobile, fax, website, billing rate, terms, opening balances, not all of this is going to apply to everybody, but if it does, just put it in. The account number, what's your account number with them? Even if, you know, they're just paying by, you know, automatic debit and you're not sending them a check, still, if you need to call this vendor for some reason, if you have that account number right there, that makes it handy. 
1099s that this could be a whole class in and of itself. But if you're paying someone who is not incorporated and you pay them more than $600 a year, you need to give them a 1099 at the end of the year. So a good practice is to ask for a W-9 from everyone that you pay. Do not assume their entity type or anything like that. An LLC, depending on their tax status, an LLC could need a 1099 if they're a single member, or they may not need a 1099 if they're an S Corp. So that W-9 will give you that information. So if needed, you can put this in there. If you need to track payments for the 1099, you can click on that. And you can save that W-9 right over here in attachments. That way you have it if you need it. And the default expense account. This is handy if it's somebody that you know is always going to be the same thing. This helps that AI bank feed know where to put stuff. It's not always correct because the great thing about QuickBooks Online is it remembers what you did the last time. The bad thing about QuickBooks Online is it remembers what you did the last time. So if you have a vendor that sometimes it's office supplies, but it could also be maybe cost of goods sold, depending on what you're buying. The AI function with Intuit is going to use whatever you put in the last time. So if it's a vendor where things change, in the bank rules, do not have it automatically enter. You want to review these things. But over here, you can pick, all right, everything I buy from this person is a job supply. And you can put that in here. And it doesn't mean it will be 100% all the time, but at least it gives you a starting point. And the other thing is QuickBooks Online does not like to delete things because when you delete things in accounting, it can screw up a lot of different things. So let's say you paid this vendor a number of things, a number of times five years ago, and they went out of business. You know you're never gonna pay them again. You know, if you were allowed to delete the vendor, what happens to all of those transactions? Because with accounting, we need those debits and credits. We need, we need the history. So in QuickBooks, it's called making it inactive. It'll hide it from your list. You won't have to look at it every day, but the history is still there. And what's interesting is the name will then say the name of the vendor, and then in parentheses, it'll say deleted. We didn't delete it. We made it inactive. I've talked to their programmers before, and yeah, they're like, yeah, just ignore it. Look. All right. So. Like I said, you can do all of these things, but vendor information, put in whatever you have as much as you can, and you will be much happier for that at some point. And vendor details, this will just all pop up. So under each vendor, you can look at the, at the transactions, whatever you paid them, they billed you and things like that, or you can look at vendor details or because you can do things a million different ways in QuickBooks, you can go up to edit and see the details over here as well. So um, Sarah, are there any questions about vendors? I do not see any. Does anybody right. have any questions about vendors? All right. And just to circle back with um, something Ben said earlier about just you know entering an expense per se. So if you just wanted to enter an expense um, under this new button, I'll go through some of these under vendors. So this is divided between customers, they give you money. Vendors, you give them money. Employees, that's a whole separate topic. Um, and then some other things. So under vendors, you have an expense. So if you pull up expense that you wanna enter, you can pick your payee. Let's say we're gonna pay our office rent. Where that payment is coming from. So 
So you would have all of your bank accounts in here. And the easiest thing to do is use tab because tab is not gonna let you forget anything. Now payment date and payment method, which you can always add new payment methods in here, cash, check, credit card. And yes, if you pay somebody with cash, get a receipt and still record it. You can put in a reference number. That might be a check number. It might be a wire number, anything like that. Tags, if we, had, if we were using tags, you can put that in there. Category is also known as an account. So we're paying our rent. So in QuickBooks, you can start by typing things in. We're gonna pay rent. Description, you can type in anything you want here. January rent, uh, you know, extra amount for whatever. Put that in there, the amount. If you are paying different things with one expense, you can add lines. Look how easy that is. And then if you don't need a certain line, you can get rid of it. There we go, we can add a line here. And if you wanna get rid of it, we have a trash can over here. You'll see a number of these. You can use the trash can to get rid of lines as well. And clear them all, add them. Memo, you can put more information in here. And once again, you have an attachment. You can add whatever you would like for an attachment. You can hit save and it brings you back to the other screen. Save and new will bring you right back to this expense screen or you realize you completely messed this up and it's not the way you want, you can just hit clear. Are you sure you wanna clear this? Yes. And it brings you right back. If you have a type of expense that is recurring, you can also put that in here, you know, um, when this occurs. A lot of times this is not used as much as it used to be because if you have your bank feed and uh, one of the monthly expenses many businesses have these days is the, their Zoom subscription. So you don't need to make your Zoom subscription a recurring expense because when that downloads in your bank transaction, it's going to be there, that sort of thing. When I like to use this recurring expense is if you have something where, okay, you need to write a check every month, you know, for whatever it is, you know, it's not on auto pay, you can put it in as a recurring expense and then it's going to pop up in your check register. And it can just be a reminder, oh yeah, I need to do that. And then you can add in your check number at that time and things like that. Without saving, yes. So that is with all of your expenses. And then there are things, once again, you can see how it works and it that's will okay. bring you to a YouTube video. And that sort of things about how to categorize transactions and it will walk you through it, where to find your downloaded transactions and things like that. All right, okay. So that's how you know, you spend the money and how you get the money going out, but you can't do much of that unless you have money to begin with. So that's where your customers and your invoicing comes in. So invoicing over here, first of all, we have our overview. And we'll give this a second. All right, so now we can um, get ready to get paid. <clears throat> All right, and this had been asked before about like, um, can you collect payments within QuickBooks? And so you can set up through here with Apple Pay, credit cards, or bank transfers. You can do all this through QuickBooks Merchant Services. And so, you know, I have a contact with them. His name is Nathan. I used to talk to him all the time when clients needed to set this up. Now, we don't need to talk to Nathan anymore. I miss him, but clients can just do this directly through here. 
you can see the rates. Um, what is nice about this is with one application, you can do Visa, MasterCard, Discover, or American Express. You can now also do Apple Pay, and you can also do bank transfers. And ask for your business info, the personal, and the deposits account that you want this to go into. Now, here is a cautionary tale. One of my clients had their office person set this up for them when the business started. The problem now is that person has left. She's actually moved out of the country, left the company, everything else. We cannot get this account to change. It's in her name, which it really should not have been because she was never a signer on the bank account. So there were some issues there as well, but we can't do anything about it without canceling the account and starting over again. So whenever I have a question for Intuit Merchant Services, I have Shannon's uh, personal information saved on my computer. I need the last four of her social. I need her date of birth and things like that. And so I have to give all of her information. Luckily, I can tell them it's me. I don't have to pretend to be her, but it just adds a level of complexity when we're trying to solve problems. We need to come up with a long-term solution for this. So be sure that it is the business owner who is doing this and be sure, you know, if you are the business owner, it is your personal information because you will never be able to change this. That sort of thing. It's there. It's there forever unless you cancel this account and get another one. So anyway, that is my word of warning with merchant services. It works great because what happens when you do this, leave without finishing, yes. And uh, because I did that, I'm probably going to get a phone call in about two minutes because I, I, I left the screen and did not sign up. But anyway, so once you do that, um, you can download a Go Payment app. So you can use credit, you can collect using debit or credit cards, depending on your business, if you're customer facing. The other thing you can do with here is send an invoice that they can pay online. So if we're going to send someone an invoice, we need to have that set up as well. And before you send an invoice, you need customers. So over here, we, can, we have customer types where you can put in, depending on what your business is, types of customers can be um, you know, business customers or uh, personal customers, you know, whether you're B2B or B2C or you're doing both, you can have them in here. You can have retail customers versus wholesale customers. The sky's the limit, whatever you need to do. You have a new customer you're going to be billing. You can click on that. And this probably looks very familiar to the vendor screen where you can put in the name of the customer, the company, the display name, you can use both, email, all of that stuff. But instead of asking for the tax information and things like that, we have these different little tabs over here. So we can have a billing address. You can have a shipping address if your company does shipping. Notes are on a separate tab. You can put in whatever you need to for notes. Tax information. In this case, we're never going to send them a 1099, but if they're tax exempt, if you're not char if your business charges sales tax and you don't need to charge this business sales tax because they have an ST5 form, you can put in their number over here under their tax exempt information. And I would attach that form over here under attachments so that you have it in case you're ever audited by the state. Payment and billing, um, are they on auto pay essentially? Is it like, okay, as soon as you have an invoice, you just charge their account, let's say. So you can fill in this information, what their terms are, you know, whether you are printing these, whether you're sending them, things like that. You can do all that through here. You also have a language option here also. 
So it will print it out in different languages, depending on what you need. There is also the option if you're an international company, the higher levels of QuickBooks allow you to use different currency methods as well. Attachments, once again, feel free to attach whatever is relevant. Additional information, this is where you can put in customer types and everything like that. Now, another hint as far as customers go, just like I mentioned with vendors, you know, you may know ABC Supply Company, but you send the check to National Supply Company. You know, the parent company is the one who gets that. Sometimes customers are the same thing. You know the business down the street that you're dealing with. You send them an invoice, but you know what? It's the parent company who's going to send you a check. So you get a check from somebody you don't recognize. You have no idea who the heck they are. And if you're the type of business where a lot of your invoices are the same amount, it can be really hard to figure out who this is for. And I hate to say it, but um, with a lot of wire transfers, EFTs, and things like that, sometimes you absolutely have no idea who sent you money. You know, it's wonderful getting money just showing up in your bank account, but when you don't know who sent it, it can get to be a problem. Or you get a check. There's no invoice number. There's no indication who this is from. Anyway, so the first time you go through and you figure that out, write it down in here. Write down everything. So let's say you get a check from National Supply House and it's actually you know, related to ABC Supply. What you can do is under company, put down National Supply Warehouse and then you can put a note next to the name, you know, uses ABC Supply. Cross-reference either your customers or your vendors as much as you need to. Um, that way, if you're doing it, if you don't get, if you don't deal with them for a while, you remember, if you have a bookkeeper, an office manager who's doing something like this, they don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out what to do with these things. So cross-reference, use lots of notes. It doesn't matter. I mean, I think you, you can have like 20,000 customers in QuickBooks, so you're not going to max it out. Put in Karen, the, yes. Sorry, yeah. I no problem. Um, okay, Stephanie wants to know, do customers need to sign up and create accounts to be invoiced through QuickBooks? They do not, no. No, um, you can send them an invoice and depending on how they want to do it, if they click, you know, pay now and things like that, they could set up their own account within QuickBooks, like if they're a vendor or something like that, or, you know, there's a way that gives them the option to save their information, but they do not need to do that. Okay. Yeah. And Sasha, we're going backwards, um, setting yes. up company information. Under income tax forms, it is recommended to select other or none if you plan to have a PCA complete your taxes, or should you just select the appropriate form that represents your company? All right. I'm not sure what a PCA is. All right. And so that's over here. Um, what I always say is put in as much information as you can. So I think she's talking about here under company type, what the tax form is. And the only thing this will do is um, if you are going to export to a um, payroll processing company, let's say, I mean, all right, let's get this out of the way. Intuit owns a ton of stuff at this point. So if you use QuickBooks online and you're using TurboTax to do your tax return, or if your tax preparer is using one of their commercial products, because they have a number of those as well, you click on which type of tax form you use, and then you can export it to those different services is where this comes in. So it gives you, you know, a 1040, which is your Schedule C. 
if you're a partnership, an S corp, a C corp, a nonprofit, and things like that. So nine times out of 10, it probably won't make a difference, but if you know what it is, it never hurts to put it in there. Okay, I have a couple more questions. Joe Lynn mm -hmm. is asking, what about a sub customer? Ah, yes, Jolyn, you can definitely do sub customers. So let's say we have my first customer here, and this is who they are. All right, so let's say now they have somebody, let me just find her, all right. Let's say they have somebody who, um, I see this a lot, a good example is like school districts. So you may have like um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, let's say, and then you have the different cities and towns underneath that. And let's say if all of these are rolling up, but each school district wants their own bill and you need to be able to do that. So you can put in a sub customer, click on that, and you can put in who is the parent. So the words that are being used is they use, you know, parent customer, they don't use child customer, they use sub customer. And then you can say whether you want to bill it with the parent or bill each one separately. So this can be where you're sending out the bills you want to show that, you know, this is for the city of Worcester, this is for the town of Grafton. You know, and then you can say, all right, but I want all of them sent to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but you want to be able to show the different ones. And what will happen over here, I'm going to have to add that, jo Jolyn, that's a great question. Under my first customer, you're going to have some indented, like, you know, an outline form with those customers underneath it. And you can go down a few different levels as well. Um, what I always say is just make sure what you're doing is meaningful. Um, I had one client who decided to make sub customers for like every different job. And it became an issue when the payments came in and then they had to put all the payments against these specific like third level um, customers going down. It, it got to be too much work and it was no longer to the point where it was meaningful at all. So we use tags instead. So a lot of times when you're using QuickBooks, it's very forgiving when you say, okay, this seems like a great idea. I'm going to do this. And then you find out after a month or two, this is not giving me what I want. It's too confusing. It's too much work. You can always go back and rewind things and change it back. So it's very forgiving like that. All right. I think I just have one more question and then I'll be all caught up. Sure. Ashlyn wants to know, since we are selling medical services and an invoice is created in our medical record system for each transaction, do we need to do this? Okay, no, no. Um, medically, um, QuickBooks Online is not HIPAA compliant. So you cannot put any patient information within QuickBooks Online. Um, I do have some medical you know, practitioners who use QuickBooks Online. And let's say if they have to write a refund check to somebody, we have a customer in there called patient. And so we don't even put, we put nothing in here as far as patients go. But as far as that sort of thing, as far as you're doing your billing through another software program, what the way we do it in QuickBooks is we let each software shine with what it does best. So the billing program does all the billing, let them do that. And then all we do in QuickBooks is record the income. We have, you know, um, you know, income, you know, we name it different things depending on what's needed, but we just record the income that comes in. We do not separate it out by patient and we do not do invoicing within QuickBooks at all. Does that answer that question? Yes, no. thank you very much. Okay. 
All right. So, all right. Anything else, Sarah? I think we're all caught up at this moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing I'll say about invoices here is you can customize this. You can put in your logo, your colors, your fonts, what you want to add on to it and things like that. And then the other thing you can do on the invoice is if you sign up for Intuit Merchant Services, you can designate how you want this client to be able to pay you. So you can say whether you want to use a bank transfer, which is the least expensive, if you want to allow them to use a credit card, which is the more expensive option, if you want them to be able to use, you know, the different payment methods, you can say which one you want to allow. What I've seen a lot of times is, depending on who the customer is, um, some clients just always put it on where they can do a bank transfer. I forget if that's 50 cents or like 1% up to $10 max. You know, so they may just put it on as bank transfer only. So when the client, when the customer clicks pay now, they only have one option. But if that client calls the business and says, you know, I really want to use my Amex card or, you know, especially if they say, you know, I don't have any cash, but I can charge it. Well, you know, you'd rather pay the 2.9% and get your money than not get any money whatsoever. So what you can do is go into the invoice, check off that you would accept a credit card and then resend it. So you do have control over how the client pays you, that sort of thing. Um, in my opinion, and I've seen this play out, you know, giving customers the option to pay just with that pay button saves you time and money in the long run because they hit pay, it automatically shows up that it's paid and you have your money within, you know, one to three days max and all the bookkeeping is done for you. Um, if your customers are sending checks, which depending on the business, sometimes it can't be helped with certain clients, it can't be helped. You know, you have to wait for them to run the check, wait for them to mail the check. The check arrives to you. Somebody's got to open it. Somebody's got to deposit it, you know, even if you have a mobile app. And then you still have to go into QuickBooks and you need to record it. So at least if they use that pay now button, you know it's paid, you know who paid it and things like that. So you're not dealing with who is this check from? Who is this wire from? And things like that. So it just, it streamlines the process. So you can do that. And we've all seen like on, uh, you know, on phones, like the little thing that sticks into the phone. So, um, you know, I see them a lot of farmer's markets actually, where someone can pay using a card you know, through the phone, you know, ju just like Venmo or anything like that. So that way, you know, you can do it right on the spot and things like that. Now, speaking of that, if someone calls you and says, you know what, I got your bill. I want to pay you with Venmo. I want to pay you with Zelle. I want to send, you know, all these different things. Um, you just have to really keep track of it because that can get overwhelming a lot of times if you have a lot of people doing it. Because once again, you sent the invoice to ABC Supply Company and now you get a payment from Venmo with Jane Doe. And if Jane Doe doesn't put in what invoice number or something like that is being paid, it's hard to keep track of it. And then also they need your Venmo account and, you know, I do recommend a business account if you're going to take it with a business, um, if you're going to accept payment by Venmo and things like that. So just put all your ducks in a row there and make sure that you have a way to figure out who sent you the money. Because It's wonderful to get unexpected money just appearing in your account. The problem is when you go back to people and say, hey, you didn't pay me. And they're like, oh, yes, I did. I sent you it by Venmo. 
And the thing is Venmo and some of these other payment systems um, like Stripe does this as well. They take their money before giving it to you. So let's say someone goes online, pays a hundred dollar bill, you're gonna get $97 appearing in your account. So then from an accounting standpoint, we need to do an adjusting entry to make sure that we gross everything up. But once again, that's another class, but it's something to keep in mind when you're accepting payments. Find a system that works for you, that is convenient for the customer. So it's really a balancing act. You want to make it convenient for your customers to pay you, but you also want to be sure you know who paid you and who still owes you money. So it's a balancing act. So we have payments. We have the customer section. And once again, I haven't mentioned it, but you can also do estimates within QuickBooks as well. So if I take my first customer under new transactions, look at all these different things we can do. We can send an invoice. We can accept a payment. We can also send an estimate. So with an estimate, it doesn't record that as a sale in QuickBooks, which is great. You know, you have someone that's interested in buying things and let's say it's a municipality or something like that. They need an estimate. They have to get it approved. You can send them this and estimates are completely different. You can put in your product and services. We can add new. I'll explain this a little bit more if we have time. All this information, once again, attachments, you send this estimate out. You can run reports showing you all of the estimates. And let's say my first customer calls in and says, yes, I want to go forward with it. You can always pull up that estimate and turn it into an invoice and send that to them for payment. So you've already done all that work. So we'll just use that again. You do have the option within QuickBooks also of charging late fees automatically. So depending on your business, if that's something you need to do, we go into account and settings over here with this little gear icon, which the gear icon, this new button over here in that first menu are three different ways to get to the same things. So you can always do that. All sales, if we had invoices in here, what we can always do is take a look. What have your sales been? Now, sales are not necessarily paid if you're sending invoices, but these are all the invoices that you've sent. And if you have different products and services, you can always go into here and put those in so you can keep track of, all right, you know, what are your customers buying from you? What sorts of products, what sorts of services? It's really all about information. And this is information that starts at the transaction level that you can then use to make better business decisions. And that's the goal here. We have two goals with the bookkeeping. We want you to be able to make well-informed business decisions, and we want you to be able to accurately file your tax return as well. And so we want to be able to balance those two things and keep it all in here. And so once again, see how it works. You can take a look at all of these things. If you have inventory, you need at least QuickBooks Plus, which is a, you know, one of the higher level services but you can track your items and things like that as well. I was thinking, you know, as far as item management and things like that, just make sure it is meaningful to you. Um, I worked with someone who did um, custom drapes, custom you know, um, products within, you know, for the home. And under different items and things like that, she had buttons and zippers and, you know, all these other things. And she was driving herself crazy sending out invoices and putting together the bundles of what she was selling because it was taking her forever. You know, fringe and different. And I asked her, I said, you know, do you care, uh, you know, how many buttons went into, you know, a pillow? And she's like, no, I said, then you know what? We're just going to get rid of it all. And we put it under supplies. 
and she put in notes and we tracked those things other ways rather than you know, through QuickBooks. So once again, just because QuickBooks can do it doesn't mean you should. It's a balancing act. You can do all of those things. So once again, you have a video, you have tips and resources. So it really walks you through all of that stuff as well. So, all right, so, so far we've gone, we've looked at banking, we've looked at invoicing, cash flow. All right, we have to, as a business, you need cash and, um, and you need to know what's coming and what's going. So this does have the option where you can look at an overview. So if you are putting in invoices with payment dates when things are due, this will keep track of that and you can view certain reports, open invoice report, customer balance report, expected money going out. This is if you put in bills to be paid. So what this does not do, like if you know you have an electric bill that's gonna be automatically withdrawn, unless that is in here as a bill to be paid and then it gets marked as paid, it's not going to be here as expected money out. So there is that limitation. And you can also take a look at how exactly this cash flow product works. Essentially, this wasn't there a few years ago, but um, there's a lot of cash flow software out there. So Intuit wanted to provide something for businesses to use within the software and things like that. But you can also look back and it can take a look at what the history is. It can pull the next three months of QuickBooks transactions. So if you have recurring bills, if you have recurring invoices to customers, it can do the best that it can to uh, predict the future based on different patterns. So you can always play around with this as well. We took a look at the expenses. Once again, if you have your, your bank feed connected, it will be bringing in those expenses as they occur. And you can say, all right, you know, this was rent, this was supplies, this was meals, different things like that. Projects is another one of those things that Intuit added because a lot of people were really asking for it. And so with a project, boom, here we go. You can put this in as far as you can see how it works, but what you're basically trying to do is what income are you expecting from this project? What are the costs and what is your, your profit? So this way, what happens is as you are recording income and expenses within QuickBooks, another thing you can do is indicate what project this is for. Now, sometimes this is Easy to do if you go and you are buying things for a specific project, if your employees or your subcontractors are working on a specific project. This can be easy to track. Um, what happens is depending on the type of business, like I work with an electrician and we had tried doing this, but the thing is, you know, he buys like, you know, ten fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 worth of supplies at one time from the warehouse. And, you know, they're all sitting in his shop. And then, you know, he goes and pulls different things out for each job. And we're like, all right, so then, you know, if we're going to do this correctly, we need to know, you know, how many light switches, how many, you know, you know, feet of electrical cord did you use and all of this other stuff. You know, if we want to get down to really nitty gritty numbers and he decided that that was just too much work. It was too much to ask the, you know, his workers to do and stuff like that. So what we basically did was come up with a base overhead cost to use. So it really depends on what your project is, what you're doing, how exactly you run this particular part of it. Aaron? Yep. JoLynn wants to know what level of QuickBooks does she need to get projects? She doesn't see it as an option on her version on, on 
Essentials. Essentials. I believe, I don't remember if you need advanced maybe or something like that. Um, and I'm trying to remember because they, they keep renaming these things in their marketing department. Um, so I think it goes now, um, start pro essentials advanced. It might be advanced, Joe. Um, I would take a look. Talison says it's in plus. It's in plus. All right. So, so plus may be above essentials now. Yes. Yeah, they, they, they keep renaming these things and driving us all crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and what I would say, you know, if, um, you know, if you can't find it specifically on yours now, one good thing that has come out of this is it's really easy to go up and down within Intuit these days, you can say, all right, you know what? I think I want to go to the next level. I think it's going to do what I want. You go up to that level. It moves all your stuff over. And then if you're like, well, wait a minute, this really isn't what I wanted. This isn't what I thought it was. You can now go backwards within QuickBooks as well. A few years ago, they did not allow that. Once you went up, they never let you go back. And now they do. So just something to know there. And they will prorate it for you as well. So if you wanted to try projects, you could, you know, upgrade to plus. And then, you know, if you liked it, you didn't like it or something like that, you could always go back. So you can do that um, projects. You know, um, you know, you track your, your your income and your costs, project labor costs, pay rates, and things like that. So, depending, you know, if you have employees, if you have a time tracking system for your employees, so you know, if they work on multiple projects at a time, they can put down which ones they worked on when, and things like that. All right. Okay. So the next item down here is payroll. Um, personally, I'm not impressed with Intuit payroll. Uh, a lot of people aren't. <laughs> you know? But what I would say is a lot of payroll programs, there are a lot of great ones out there, and many of them will export directly into QuickBooks so that you do not have to um, you know, do specific journal entries in QuickBooks and things like that. So I'd say, you know, payroll, always, 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 always hire a payroll company. It is well worth the money um, and get something that exports into QuickBooks, that sort of thing. Contractors, these are essentially your 1099s and things like that. And so many times you can pay them um, a variety of different ways. I know some find it easier. If you have employees already, you can add contractors to your payroll service as well. And that way they're automatically sent their 1099s and you don't have to worry about it. So there's a variety of ways of paying contractors as well. Um, one thing to note, especially, you know, um, 1099s were just due on Monday. And I know I field a lot of questions with, yeah, but my contractor won't give me their 109, you know, their, their W9. I can't send them this. Right. Here's the secret. Don't pay them until you get the W9 in the first place. All right. This way you know whether or not they're going to ever give it to you. Um, early in my career, I worked for a Fortune 500 company. And it was in the AP system. Now, this was an international company. AP literally could not print a check. This is the days of checks without having that W-9 and that tax ID on file, even if they did not need a 1099, if they were a corporation. Um, I was in the tax department. We had that fail safe put in because... Um, we had been audited for 1099s. That happened when the company was young. 
And let's just say um, they came out of there making a lot of money, those auditors, because it was really screwed up in the early days. So we did that. And that's also a good thing to use for a lot of small businesses. And I know sometimes, you know, that first check to a contractor, you know, it's late, you want them to get started the whole bit. But then you know what, by that second check, get that W-9 form, just get it. It makes it so much easier rather than waiting until January and doing that. Now, that being said, I just need to mention also workers' comp insurance. Massachusetts requires workers' comp insurance. I was called to jury duty once. I was in college, and it was a workers' compensation case. It was dull. It was boring. The testimony from the doctor was so bad, the judge made them stop. It took so long. But workers' comp is required. So if you have employees, nine times out of 10, your payroll company offers pay-as-you-go workers' comp. Ask them about it. It works great. And as far as your subcontractors go, ask them if they have workers' compensation. Depending on your type of business, you may have to add them to your workers' comp policy. Um, two of my clients are in construction. And so these contractors, you know, one time we found out someone did not have workers' comp, we added them onto the business insurance. And during the audit for the business, we had to provide their workers' comp certificates for the contractors. And if the contractors didn't have workers' comp, the business had to pay for it. So that's the kind of thing it's not worth playing around with. Just get it. It makes your life a lot easier in the long run. So that's payroll. But yes, so get a payroll company and make sure that they import into QuickBooks and a tax tip. If you are a corporation or a partnership and you're on payroll, you need to, on the book, separate out the, um, the officer's wages. I'm sorry, not, not for a partnership, sorry. They don't get wages. So partnerships and sole proprietors are not on payroll. They just take a draw and they pay taxes on their profits. If you have an S Corp or a C Corp, the officer needs to be on payroll. That's another whole class in that sort of thing. But in the bookkeeping, you need to separate out that payroll because that needs to be separated on the tax return. So it's easier to do that on an ongoing basis. And then you also want to break out for payroll, officer's payroll, if there is one, employee payroll, payroll taxes, the taxes that the company pays, not the withholding, and then the payroll fees. Those should all be, be separate line items on your profit and loss. And then that way it is easier for the tax preparer to tie everything out. Because we want to make sure those numbers match because the IRS knows those numbers for the payroll taxes and the wages. So we want to keep everybody happy. So we do that. The next thing, oh, any questions about that, Sarah, before I go on? Oh, you're on mute. Big mistake. Um, I don't see any questions. Okay. If anybody has anything and wants to unmute and ask, go right ahead. Otherwise, we can move on. Move on. All right. Well, related to payroll and sometimes just with contractors and things like that. You can also track time within QuickBooks, that sort of thing. Once again, we have a video. Um, and what this does is, I see this a lot with lawyers' offices because lawyers bill for their time. So you'll have your associates, you'll have your attorneys and things like that. Tracking their time, they'll say, you know, I worked for... I did some work for Karen, I did some work for Sarah, and then those time entries then move their way onto the invoices. Um, there's a lot of different time tracking systems out there. So I always say, you know, 
take a look and see what works best for your company and how you track time and things like that. There are also separate apps that also have geolocation trackers. And what was very interesting is I had a lawyer who had a satellite office and they kind of suspected that the attorney would, this is pre-COVID, was not spending the amount of time at the office that she should have been spending because they were hearing things from their, their, their neighbors at the satellite office. Oh, gee, we haven't seen her in days and all this other stuff. And, you know, it was just getting a little concerning. So I helped them find a time tracking software that did have geolocation as well. And they did a very nice marketing packet so that it didn't sound like Big Brother um, and things like that. And what was very interesting is that lawyer quit. <laughs> <laughs> before it started, which just kind of, it's like, yes, she wasn't actually in there. And the thing is, there were um, complaints from clients who were like, well, we got this bill, but we never met with her on that date. So, you know, uh, falsely billing clients is a big, big no-no. So we were able to deal with that. So there's a variety of time soft time tracking software on there. And whether you use it within QuickBooks, um, many of them will sync, sync with QuickBooks from an outside firm and things like that. And you can run reports. And so depending on your business and what you're tracking, this is always a nice feature as well. All right. Karen, Dean had a question. He wants sure. to know if he needs workers comp if he has a C corporation and he's the only employee. You know, in um, most circumstances in Massachusetts, if you are the owner, you can opt out of workers comp. There is a form to fill out on a yearly basis that gets sent to... I don't know, one of those uh, very long name departments in Massachusetts that you never hear about, but they have, I think the industrial something or whatever, but yes, you can opt out of it and um, you just have to file that form every year saying that you opted out of it. So I would check on that. Um, one thing I do say, especially to my clients in construction, is depending on the type of work you do, it can be short money to buy the workers' compensation insurance. So, you know, it's one thing if you work in an office and the biggest thing that could happen to you is a paper cut, um, as opposed to if you are putting new roofs or chimneys on something and you could potentially all three or four stories, things like that. So I always say, you know, take a look at your risk and um, decide. And if you opt out of it, there's just a form that you need to do for Massachusetts. So things like that. All right, there's your time. And then once you get all of this stuff in there, now comes the fun. Now you get to see reports. Now you get to see what all of your hard work did for you. And you've got lots of different reports in here. Once again, depending on the level of QuickBooks you have, um, I know the solopreneur self-employed version does not have a lot of these things. I'm not sure they have any because that's the calls that I get. But even Simple Start has a number of these things. So... These are always your favorites, your accounts receivable aging, your balance sheet. And I know Tom goes through this, these different reports in Accounting 101. Your balance sheet is what you own and what you owe. It's, it's, it, it's a snapshot of then and of now. Uh, profit and loss is how much money you brought in, how much money you left. So you can run that for a week, a month, a year, things like that. And depending on the type of entity, both of these reports can come into play when you do your tax return. So that's why they're important. But you also have a lot of things with business overview. You have an audit log within QuickBooks where you can see which users logged in and did what. 
Um, so sometimes I get the question with, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, give my front desk person my login for QuickBooks so they can go in and do this stuff. No, 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 no. Um, every user um, needs their own ID within QuickBooks. You can specify what that person has access to, and you can also see what that person possibly did. And the other thing is that, all right, we all forget our passwords, okay? Or we change it and we forget to write it down that we changed it, then we don't remember what it was. It's just something that happens in modern society. So what happens is if, if everyone is using that one password, guess what happens when person B who's using that, that login and password can't remember what the new password was or they didn't get told the main person changed the password? Well, now the text to verify your identity is going to somebody completely different. And depending on where they are, you may lose an hour or two of work, everyone gets frustrated, you end up with a text chain with who knows the password. It's just not worth it. Just give everybody their own ID, they can reset their own password and all is well in the world. Just do that, um, that sort of thing. And then, you know what, in the off chance that something really goes wrong, you can always look and see what's going on within the system itself. Um, one of the most popular ways to steal from a business by the employees is to put in a vendor that does not exist and just pay them a little bit of money here and there. So a lot of times, you know, we want to restrict who gets to add vendors um, and things like that, especially if you're printing out checks. So we never want to believe anybody is going to steal from us. I've seen it happen between spouses. I've seen it happen between parents and children. Um, my daughter's soccer coach, when she was little, he did white collar crime for the state police. And yeah, some of his stories were just absolutely horrifying. So different IDs, give everyone their own passwords, give everyone their own level of activity, keep those checks under lock and key, get the uh, bank ID that's read only. All those things can only help and no one's gonna try to do anything if they don't have access. So anyway, today's warning. But look at all these different reports that you can do. So we can, um, you know, prop, profit and loss by tag group as a percentage of income, who owes you, where your different sales are, what you owe people, your vendors, here's your 1099 report for the accountant. So you can really do a lot of things here. And there is a lot available, but you can also do customized reports. So if there's something that you like to see, um, you can always do that. And then QuickBooks does also have some management reports that kind of try to make things look a little bit nicer than all that. So management report for this period, you can put in your logo, management use only, and you can add what you want to see here. So th th this is just a little prettier than just a whole bunch of PDFs and things like that, especially if you're going to a bank for financing and things like that. They also do an expanded version. This is seven pages. This gets into AR aging, but you can, um, with this thing, you, you can edit it the different pages. There's also a bunch of tie-ins with QuickBooks as far as you can do some graphs, you can do pie charts and things like that. And you can even do some things in here as well for the different report periods. And that being said, even when we're looking at the standard reports, same looking at this profit and loss, you can always customize these reports the report period, you know, if your numbers are in the millions, you can divide by thousands. How do you want to show the negative numbers? You can put in all your columns, you can put in your filters and things like that. So 
depending on what you're trying to do, you can really have a lot of fun with these. And up here, favorites. If you have standard reports that are favorites, just you know, click on them. Click on the stars. And when you do have something here, you can do a few things. You can email it. You'll see these a lot of places in QuickBooks. You can email anything, you can print it, you can export it, and this does PDF and Excel. And I haven't given this enough attention, but this settings icon here, ah, there we go. This is where you can do some quick change of columns, uh, reorder the columns, things like that. You can save your customization. You can do a lot of things in the report center and that sort of thing. So, you know, so all this stuff that we've done all ends up in the reports. Do that. Taxes, this area, if you're collecting sales tax, once again, that's an, could be another separate class. Um, if you're just dealing with one state or another, um you can use quickbooks it can handle that if you're dealing with a lot of states um there are different tax software programs that um do a really good job with sales tax in massachusetts we are very lucky that we have one sales tax right throughout the entire state this is showing you just you know um, in Mountain View, California here, we have the state rate, the Santa Clara County, and the district, three different types of taxes. So if you're getting into a lot of different sales taxes, a lot of times your platforms may help you. Etsy does their own sales tax collection. We don't have to worry about it if you're on Etsy. So depending on what you're doing with your checkout card and all this other things, you can get tie-ins with sales tax. Once again, just like with workers' comp, do not play around with sales tax. The states all need money. Um, a number of years ago, there was a case that made it to the Supreme Court, um, North Dakota versus our very own Wayfair here in Massachusetts. And um, the state of North Dakota won. So Wayfair needs to charge in every state. There are different levels. If you sell books and you sell one book in the state of Mississippi, that does not mean you need to collect sales tax. But you need to show if you get audited by Mississippi, you only sold one book in Mississippi and that sort of thing. So, you know, there are things to do if you get to that point in order to keep track of it. Um, also, if you sell on any of the big behemoths like Amazon or things like that, they handle the sales tax for you. So sometimes some people think, you know, find that it's worth paying their fees, just they don't have to worry about anything. 1099s can also be filed through QuickBooks online, or this can also um, export into another system. Personally, I don't use this one because I can't tell when someone opens the email they get and things like that. So I export from QuickBooks Online to another program and then I can see who has opened their 1099 letter, who has not, and if they don't, then I can email it out. Um, they do offer a print and mail 1099 kit. Don't, just don't. Um, they charge you, you get charged a lot of money for a piece of paper, for pieces of paper and things like that. Um, many of the systems, if people do not open their email by a certain date, you can may email, I'm sorry, you can snail mail it to them for like $1.69, including the postage. So this is really good because you can get your reports out of here and things like that. And then just depending on what's happening, you can do that. Um, I often get asked, well, can I just print out the forms from QuickBooks and mail them in without doing this 1099 kit? And the answer is no. The IRS needs these forms on special paper with red ink so that they can throw it through their system and read it all. 
So you need special paper. You can't just print it out in black and white and mail it in. It's going to be considered late. They're going to send you a nasty letter. It gets really, it's bad. Just do it right the first time. So, all right. Okay. Um, mileage is another feature in here. Um, it does only work for one person. So if you, the business owner, are the only one who needs to track mileage, you can do this. Um, and it will print out a report that shows you what your mileage was for any given point in time. You can do it through the QR code. You can record it manually. And what it does is whenever you're driving and you go over seven miles an hour, it is, assumes, you know, and of course you have your phone with you. So whenever your phone is going more than seven miles an hour, it assumes you're not under your own power and you are moving. So what happens is it will track you went from point A to point B. Then you take a look at the report on the app and you can say whether it was personal or business. And you can then under business say what you were doing. And then if you fill all that information in, you can print out a report that is IRS compliant for your mileage and things like that. If you have employees that you're reimbursing for mileage and things like that, um, like I said, you only get one account with this. So you would need to do something else like um, the time tracking app I was mentioning earlier that had a geolocator and everything. That one also did, did mileage as well. So you have all of that stuff. So you can track mileage through here, accounting, depending on your um, level of QuickBooks and things like that, this might be called something else. Your chart of accounts. These are all the diff different accounts we can use. I've got a checking account. I've got a savings account. I have petty cash. When you're naming your different accounts, and we also have a credit card, use the last three or four digits of that account in the name. It just helps because once you start, if you get multiple accounts and things like that, you know, a lot of banks have some very interesting names that they give their accounts. And if you have a bookkeeper who's trying to do this, and even yourself after a while, I have one client, he cannot keep his five different bank accounts, you know, straight. There's just too many of them. And so we, we've renamed them a few times trying to make this easier. But once again, put in little notes and things like that. And you can put in, you can add accounts and things like that. There are certain accounts in here that you're like, oh, I don't need an uncategorized expense. I'm never going to have that. There are certain things into it will not let you get rid of an account because if you don't put in a certain account, it needs somewhere to put it. So like reconciliation discrepancies, please, please, please never reconcile with a discrepancy. But if you happen to hit it or something like that, or you just don't know what to do with it, and you use reconciliation discrepancies, have someone go back and try to figure it out for you. But so there, there are certain ones where it's never gonna let you do it, but you can always add a new account and then you can pick your account type. What type of account is it? If you wanna put some more details in, the name of your account, your description, you can always make sub accounts as well. And then, you know, when do you want to start tracking this? You know, at the beginning of the year, last year, and things like that. And the other very important thing, like with checking accounts, petty cash, even credit cards, things like that, you always want to reconcile your account. Now, a question I often get is, yeah, but I'm uploading everything from the bank feed. It should be fine. Should is the key word here. Remember, we're talking about AI. We're talking about computer systems. Things are not always perfect. Um, you know, I've seen, you know, banks have some sort of weird outage, you know, and stuff from like November 1st through November 4th, never exported you know, things like that, or else when you're going through the bank feed, instead of entering something, oops, it got, you know, excluded. 
or else you entered an expense because you were at the store on Friday the 4th, but when that transaction came through the bank, it didn't come through until Monday the 6th. And, you know, QuickBooks never figured out the two are the same. So now you have double expense in there. So there are things that go wrong. So if you go to new and you go to, it's not here. So why don't we go over here? And there's usually a reconciliation. I think it's because I don't have enough information in here. Oh, it's under here, under tools. We go to reconcile. It's always somewhere. And so once again, th this is a long one, almost eight minutes. It will go through how to reconcile your accounts. So it's very much akin to the old days where we had the check register and your bank account had that thing on the back, your debits, your credits, what's outstanding. You go through this and you can reconcile your account because you wanna be sure that nothing is in there twice and that everything is in there at least once. So always reconcile things Karen, like that. Yes. Daniel wants to know what the implications of making an account with a zero balance inactive. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Yep. Okay. Thank yep. you. You can do that. Now, what happens though, if you make an account inactive and then a year, two years, the next day, whatever, you're like, oh gosh, I actually need that back. What you can always do is go over here to the gear icon or the flower, depending on how you look at it. And this will say what you're showing, but you can always do include inactive. So if there's something that, oops, you didn't need to do it or you need to bring it back, you can always reactivate an account as well. Um, other thing here, under banking, if we could see this, what happens is you'll have the bank balance and then you'll have the QuickBooks balance. And I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten over the years when the QuickBooks balance is higher than the bank balance. And people call me absolutely terrified that somebody hacked into their bank account and took their money. Here's the thing. Having those two numbers exactly match is a fluke, really. Because what happens is that bank account is when the bank last sent everything over or when Intuit went and got the account. Some banks only send things over once a day. Some banks, you know, may send it throughout the day and you can hit update. So what happens is, all right, you're on the bank thing and they say your balance is 25,000. You look in QuickBooks and it says, you know, it's 28,000. What happened to the $3,000? Things happen like checks clear on one and not the other. When your bank fee comes through into QuickBooks, the stuff that's listed in the bank feed is not in that QuickBooks balance yet. You have to assign it and you have to enter it. So that happens. What also happens is if you had gone into QuickBooks and you wrote out like, okay, I just wrote out a check for $10,000, you record it in QuickBooks so that you, it shows the money is gone. But if that check hasn't gone through the bank yet, the bank balance is $10,000 higher. So there's a lot of things that can happen between those two numbers. So what I tell people is do not panic that those numbers do not match because chances are they never will. Things happen and things like that. But, you know, I mean, it gives you a bit of an idea. So, you know, you know what's happening. It's, it's just a tool to use. So, so you know, we're closing in here, but under new, you know, you can do different things with customers, vendors, other, pay down credit card. This icon over here also has a variety of things. Um, custom form styles. This lets you say, what do you want all of that to look like? All of your forms and things like that. You can upload a logo. You know, QuickBooks Online is a canned software package. So you can 
make it your own to a certain degree and things like that. So um, do it, do what you can just realize you're not going to be able to change everything with it. Then you have all of your lists, your products, your services, your tags, your attachments. You can do budgeting in here. Here's your audit log. Smart look if you have to call it QuickBooks and they're like, all right, let's use smart look. What smart look does is it they will it will give you a number in smart look. So as you're on the phone with them, you give the agent this number they can then see your screen and you have full ability to like disconnect them if you need to. Um, another thing with help here, you can do this. My recommendation is do not post anything on the community forums. Um, I've had the experience where, all right, I tried. I posted on the community forum. I got a phone call. And at first it sounded like someone from Intuit, hey, we saw this, this and that. But then when they started asking for me to share my screen and they weren't looking using Smart Look, which I know is what they're supposed to do, I realized it was a scammer. It was somebody who follows that community page and calls people up and they then try to get um, access to your computer. So don't post on the community page. Um, contact somebody at the SBA, contact somebody you know, look at the videos. And I don't believe I'm going to do this, but I'm going to recommend someone that I know on, um, what's it called, on YouTube. Let me get his stuff up. Um, gentleman's name is Hector, and he does a variety of uh, Hector Garcia here, and he does QuickBooks. Let me see. All right, here we go. He does QuickBooks videos. So if you look up H Hector Garcia CPA, he has 827 videos on QuickBooks on here. He does online and he does desktop. But if there's something you're looking at in QuickBooks that just isn't telling you what you want, check out Hector. He's really good. Um, he does have a paid program as well, but anybody can go in and watch his things. He does bank reconciliations and stuff like that. So there's just another way to look things up as well. And, you know, as has been said by Sarah and Tom, you know, the SBA is another great resource as well. And um, I think I'm going to stop it there, Sarah, and just ask, is there any other questions or, you know, anything else here? Does anybody want to unmute and ask Karen a question about any of this while we have her? Such a quiet group. Uh, I guess I have a quick question. My name is Talison. Yes, hello. Hi, Karen. Thank you. This was really helpful. Um, I maybe you said this, but probably the easiest thing would be to use QuickBooks and hire an accountant, right? Just do both. Uh yes. <laughs> All right, and the way um, a number of people will work, because uh, I know myself included, um, you can find people who will either, all right, usually in the growth of a business, something that generally happens is someone starts a business, they get QuickBooks, um, they um, either hire somebody or go online, do lots of things um, and start doing it themselves. Then like the next step is usually, you know, getting somebody to do like a quarterly review, you know, which is easy enough on Zoom, ask questions, things like that. And then as the business grows, you know, outsource more of the bookkeeping and things like that. 
And the great thing about starting it correctly is when you are ready to say, you know what, I just don't have the time to do the, this reconciliation. I don't have the time to do my bank feed. I want somebody else to do it. That makes it easier to outsource. Um, that being said, I've had clients where, you know, they may start by having, you know, whoever's at the front desk or one of the employees start doing some of the QuickBooks stuff, but depending on what they're doing, sometimes depending on what the bank balances are and things like that, it may not be something you want the employees to see. Hmm. Or else if there's payroll being recorded in QuickBooks, you know, it's not, sometimes it's not a good idea for everybody to see what everybody else is making. So, you know, for, for privacy reasons, that's why some people outsource it that sort of thing. Um, but you can definitely do that. Um, that being said, there are times there are certain things the business owner should maintain. Um, what I find helpful is sometimes, you know, when there's invoicing to be, be done, by the time you tell the bookkeeper what to invoice, you could have done the invoice yourself. Things like that. So, okay. um, so outsourcing, you know, can definitely be helpful and things like that. So it's just and, on and a case. I basis. know this is probably variable, but I, I mean, I guess I, you know, I'm just starting. And so maybe yeah. part of me is feeling a little bit overwhelmed and this has been super helpful. So I, I mean, I know that I know that I could just spend a bunch of time and do all this myself, but part yeah. of me is just wondering if you can give me a like vague sense of if I were going to have someone doing quarterly reviews, what that would cost. Mm -hmm. You know, that really depends. And I, I hate to give um, a <laughs> blanket um, thing over here. I, I hate to say, you know, I've been burnt myself many times, um, you know, with, you know, you give a, um, an estimate to find out there's like, you know, 10 bank accounts, you know, uh, and I things, see. things like that. Um, sometimes a good way to do it, um, like what I do with some clients is like a QuickBooks startup package, because even if the business owner is outsourcing the bookkeeping, you always want to know what's going on and how to run reports and how to look at things. So with like a QuickBooks startup type thing with, okay, let's get all this worked out. Let's make sure you know what's going on. And sometimes by the end of that startup, the, the business owners are like, all right, I've learned a lot and I've learned I don't want to do it. <laughs> and that sort of thing. But, you know, not understand, you know, being able to understand your own books is really, really important, even if you don't want to do it on a daily basis. That sort of thing. So. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, reach out to the um, SBA at Clark and they can put you in touch with someone who can talk more about your specific situation and what may need to be done. So, okay. Thank you. And thanks again. Right. This was really useful. No problem. No problem. So, all right. I think Joe Lynn has a question. Okay. Jo Lynn, is it safe to unmute? Okay, yes, it is safe to unmute. Un <laughs> um, so uh, I've been in QuickBooks Online since October. Uh -huh. New, new at QuickBooks. Um, um, so the salary for the only officer, I have not been separating out uh -huh. uh, from all the other staff. In fact, uh, we have support staff and we have direct labor and I've just been throwing it all into just salaries. So yep. can you give me more details about what would be a better plan and how deep do I go? Like, could I do it a, a quarterly journal entry? Um, and where would I put the salary? Cause right now I just have it mostly in, um, just salaries. Salaries. <laughs> um, right, so basically, you know, depending on how often the reports are being looked at. So if it's a company that is doing monthly reporting, what you can do is a journal entry every month and things like that. I mean, at this point in the year, I know many customers and clients are like, all right, I just need to get 2021 done. 
and they may just do one big journal entry to move everything. Um, so what you can do is like under new, there's the journal entry feature. So you can use, you know, whatever you want the journal date to be, you know, if we're just changing, you know, from last year, you can write in a thing, but and then you may need to start a new account. So this is a good time to use like the parent accounts there. So you can have a parent account being like, you know, uh, payroll wages. Then you can have a sub account for officer wages, a sub account for employee wages or however else you need to change that. And then you can put in an entry to move some of that money around. And the reason you kind of want all the wages to add up like on your profit and loss is because when you take a look at like say you're on W3 at the end of the year, what were the what are the total wages being reported to social security? things like that. You want to be able to just quickly look at, onto QuickBooks and see that they match. So real real quick as a follow-up to that, yeah. um, I, I totally get having it all match. So um, do I, like I get a report from payroll yeah. that has, of course, everybody's individual items, but then of course we have to pay taxes in addition to what the employee does. Mm -hmm. Uh, am I going to go down every single line item and associate which part of, let's just say it's, um, I don't know, any of the things that we have to add yeah. and have to um, allocate it, every line item, which goes to the officer and which goes to supporting staff. And if that's what I have to do, is there a good tool? Because I just see it as a nightmare that I'm just yes. getting one line item, you know, and it's yeah, like, so okay. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the payroll taxes do not need to be divided between the, the officer and the other employees, only the wages. And depending on your payroll program, some of them you can put everyone into a department. So you could have like a subtotal within your payroll um, account with, within your payroll reports you know, these are the support staff, you know, here's the total for the officers. So I would um, talk to your payroll company about that, depending on how many people we're dealing with here. But yeah, the, the employer payroll taxes can all go on one line because yes, that would be a nightmare. To straighten that out. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, listen, best of luck to everyone here with QuickBooks. Um, you know, watch the SBA with their upcoming classes. I don't know if Sarah has any details about those. Yeah, um, well, for existing clients of ours, if you need help with chart of accounts or setting up an operating budget, reach out to me and I will set that up with your advisor because we also have interns on board that are eager and willing to help out with this task. Um, I've dropped a few links. I'm going to condense them all into one follow-up email, how to reach me, how to reach Tom, how to register, how to do this, do that. Karen, I'll have her information in there as well. So if there's anything we didn't cover in this chat and you want an answer, You'll have an, you'll have a contact. Yeah. Any parting words, Karen? You've been tremendous. Yeah. Well, it's funny because when when I was asked to do this, and Tom was like, "Oh, you know, how long do you need?" I'm like, "I could go on for a week." <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, this has been great and we no. hope that you will come back and we'll, um, I've asked everyone to answer a survey so we can see what was helpful, what wasn't maybe future topics. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Could... You know, um, you know, was it helpful doing the QuickBooks thing as opposed to a PowerPoint presentation and things like that. So yeah, always looking for, you know, what can make this easier to understand and more meaningful for everyone. 
super. Okay, all this will wrap it up and I will, as I said, send out a follow up email this afternoon with all the information you need and much, much more. Wonderful. And thank you, Karen. This has been great. Um, yes, and thank you, Sarah, for um, taking care of the chat and keeping everything in line here. You're so. very welcome. You guys have a good day and stay warm. Yes, definitely. All right, everyone. Best of luck. Bye now.